So my name is Eric Palmer, and I'm a software integration engineer here at NERSC, and I'm very happy today to be here with you to talk about migrating from Cori to Perlmutter. Um, today, the focus of my talk is, is CPU-only codes. Um, you know, I, I, I'm, I aim to this talk to give you lots of information, or it's a, a general understanding, so you can do what you need to do with your CPU codes, uh, but I'm not going to get super technical to maximize ultimate performance. So um, hopefully you'll find this useful, but if you want to eke out every inch of performance in your application on Perlmutter, you're, you're going to have to come back for more. <laughs> so um, these are the topics I'm, I'm looking to cover today, and I picked these four uh, mostly because I see these as the major differences between uh, Cori and Perlmutter. So, you know, the modules are slightly, the module system is slightly different. Uh, the programming environments, when we talk about what compilers are, avail are available, um, what flags you need to get the with the things to get what you want, uh, those are slightly different. Um, the way you compile codes, um, pretty similar with one small point, that one flag I just mentioned, uh, and the job scripts because the architecture for the nodes has changed. So those are the things I, I'm, I'm highlighting here in this talk. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is, is modules. Um, and, you know, your experience with Cori and modules is still valid on Perlmutter. It works largely the same. Um, when you log on to Perlmutter, uh, a Perlmutter login node, uh, you're going to the, have these modules loaded by default. And the thing to point out is that um, a few things here is, is one of these modules represents the CPU architecture that the Cray compiling program environment, will, which I'll mention later, is going to use to optimize your code. Another one is the default programming environment, which again, we'll, we'll, we'll get to more um, later, is the GNU programming environment. But also the third one is, is really important here, is if you're doing a CPU-only code, uh, the default module right now is to load, the default modules load this GPU module. And that enables the CUDA where MPI by default, it also loads several modules that are targeted towards GPU codes uh, that we recommend you 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 uh, essentially uh, disable by doing module load CPU if you're doing CPU only codes. So the first step is you come into Perlmutter, you log in, you know you're doing CPU only code, you should look at doing, we recommend you use module load CPU to get your environment uh, set up the way that will be best useful for you. The rest of the module stuff is, is still fairly similar to what you've seen on Cori. Um, the commands here, such as module list, uh, module load, unload, module swap, um, should be exactly the same. The two following commands, uh, this one may, this is one that I don't know that everyone knows. Uh, I feel like these ones people use all the time, but maybe this one, um, maybe not so much. This will give you a lot of information about what the module is doing. And I have an example later to show you that. Finally, this last one is gonna be the focus of my next four slides, because I really wanna drive this point home that um, if you're using module avail to find a module, uh, or to find software on Perlmutter, you might not see everything right away. Whereas if you use module spider, um, you're going to have access to more potential modules and more information for how to get to what you want um, right away. So that's what's going on with this module spider here. And we'll talk more about that in a second. Um, finally, on this slide, I put useful tricks that I found useful and I think may uh, be helpful for other people. Um, if you would, you, if you prefer to just grep for a string through all the modules, you can use this line. Right, where you can redirect the module output to your favorite uh, you know, Linux um, utility. Uh, the, you can, for instead of using module list, you can use the shortcut ML-T, and this will put a nice vertical list of your modules. So if you wanna share those with somebody else in like an email or a ticket, it's a good way to do it. And another one is module reset, which will reset your module environment back to the system default. So that can be useful for, for creating a replicable uh, environment when you want to test things and, and run, run stuff. So as promised, uh, this is all about module spider versus module avail. 
Now they both still exist on Perlmutter, but the function slightly differently, right? The, and the reason is, is that the module system on Perlmutter is slightly different than the one on Cori. The module system on Perlmutter is called LMOD, um, where the one on Cori, I believe, was Tickle. The difference is, is they have a hierarchical structure. So if your module depends on another module being loaded for it to be able to be loaded, it may not show you that you can load that module. So that's why we have module spider, which will search those regardless of that structure and make basically give you more hits on any search you get. So to illustrate that, I have an example where I'm trying to load, I believe it is, it'll tell me, I promise. I think it's net CDF, yeah. So we want to load just the, the, the plain vanilla create net CDF. And this is just showing us that it's not currently loaded. Um, we try to load it and we get an error. If you use this other module show command, it's still unhappy. Um, now we're going to use module avail to look for it. And you see net CDF shows up, but that's not the one we want. And it doesn't give any other hits, right? So it essentially looks like we can't find the module we want that create net CDF. But if we use module spider and we put in create net CDF, all of a sudden we get a hit, right? And what modules, what this module info spider's information is telling you to do is to type out the full thing with the version. You get more information, and this is where it tells you, oh, if you wanted to load Cray Net CDF, you have to load Cray HDF5 first. And if I do that, we find that the module loads, we get the software we want, and, and everyone's happy. So in conclusion, <laughs> module spider for the win. Uh, module avail, uh, you can it still works, still useful. But but if you're looking for something and you're not finding it, please try module spider. This slide I included because I I think it's helpful when you are trying to figure out, um, especially like libraries. You want to make sure your library is linking, or you want to link a library to your application. It's really helpful to be able to use this module show and see what loading a module does to your user environment. So. In particular, I would highlight the yellows and greens where the yellow is setting particular environment variables. Um, sorry, the green is where the, the environment variables are being set. So if you're, um, when you're making your program or building your program, if it's looking for the HDF5 directory, it's gonna set that variable to that directory. So that tells you where it's looking for it. Uh, the yellows, you know, changing your path, where it's going to be looking for libraries. So if you're wondering where do I pull, you know, if I want to explicitly link and I'm looking for the place for that library, uh, I can I can do it this way. Uh, I get a lot of information from module show. Okay, so that was the my major things on on modules. Uh, that I, the next thing I'm going to talk about are programming environments. Um, The three big programming environments on Perlmutter are the GNU programming environment, the NVIDIA programming environment, and the Cray programming environment. Um, we no longer have a programming environment for Intel. So um, I know that's been a pain point for a lot of people. So hopefully the information here today will make it less painful to try maybe say this, uh, the GNU programming environment and the GCC compilers and the G4Tran compiler and, and whatnot. Um, for CPU only codes, uh, you know, typically we're gonna recommend that you try this one first. Uh, if the, the GNU programming environment isn't working for you, you can. it's really easy to switch to a different programming environment such as a Cray one and give Cray a shot. And, and sometimes if your code is not compiling, just switching from GNU to Cray and it compiles and works and you're you're good to go, then, then you're good to go. Like both of them are equally valid. The important thing to for, with programming environments is that they work with the Cray compiler wrappers here. So for example, if I wanna compile a C++ code and I have my compile line, you know, CC, I'll, I'll just make it up for now because we're going to cover it later. My, I'm going to say CC and the commands to compile my code. Well, if I'm in the programming environment GNU, Cray is going to automatically change that CC to the G++ compiler, right? Um, 
you know, the appropriate command for the G++ compiler. So maybe I should use this one as an example because I did this one yesterday, I know it. <laughs> so it's going to change this to the command we want, add a bunch of stuff that we're, we're going to see, and then it's going to compile your code. Now, rather than that exact same compile line, if I'm using the compile wrapper, if I switch to program environment NVIDIA and I use that exact same line, it's going to use the NVC compiler to compile my code as long as I'm using the wrapper and it's going to make other necessary adjustments under the, the hood. So programming environments work really well in conjunction with these wrappers. And so we recommend that, that you uh, give them a shot and try them in this way. Um, as I mentioned, you know, switching between program environments can be useful for, for testing things and solving problems. This is pretty straightforward. Uh, you don't have to use the swap or unload. You can just, if you're in, if for example, I'm in programming environment, the GNU programming environment, and I want to go to the Cray programming environment, all I need to do is type module load program environment Cray, and, and I'm there. OK, so this slide has a lot of stuff on it, but this is going to bring some of that point um, that I was sort of making about some of the benefits to using the Cray uh, compiler wrappers. So. Um, what this is doing is sort of comparing two different ways of compiling the same Hello World OpenMC, OpenMP code. So suppose I use the GCC command and I compile my code. You are seeing here everything that's, that's going into the compile line, right? If I use the CC wrapper instead, um, what I've done on this line is I've uh, enabled this flag, the kp verbose which will show me all the stuff that's being put into the compile line when I do this CC, when I use the wrapper to compile, um, that's being hidden behind the CC. So what you will see on the command line, if you're using the CC uh, wrapper, is you'll just do CC, hello world, underscore openmp.c, and so on to compile your code. And behind the scenes, all these optimizations uh, for the CPU architecture, um, the MPI libraries will be included, the science libraries, the create science libraries will be included, the, the libraries that correspond with the GNU compiler, all correlated with that programming environment will match um, and be automatically taken care of when you're using the create compiler wrappers. Whereas if you're doing GCC, then, then you have to, you're responsible for that for yourself. And <laughs> if you wanna, even if you decide to use them, even knowing this can be helpful for maybe refining this exactly. So the wrappers, like I said, uh, they provide a lot of stuff automatically under the hood. Uh, they link MPI, your science libraries, LAPAC, BLAST, Scala pack, and more just automatically. Um, if you have Crave modules like HDF5 and FFTW, they'll also be automatically linked. And the, the compiler that was used to compile those libraries will correspond to the one that you're using with the compiler. Um, uh, this note, I think, is important, too, uh, for people who sometimes people have uh, particular uh, questions about science libraries. You can, this demand lib size is a good way to get detailed information about how the science libraries work in the create programming environment. Um, if you have a build system um, such as CMake, uh, you may need to explicitly tell it to use the wrappers in this, with a line like this, right? Um, to include this line to tell CMake, these are the, the compilers I want to use, um, and it will take care of the rest. If you have the traditional configure make, you know, make install type of building, um, you may find that you need to include this line to specify um, the particular, the wrappers uh, properly to, to build your function. Um, on Perlmutter, the default is for my, um, for libraries to link dynamically. Um, so, so what that means is, you know, like I said, when you load that module into your your environment, uh, it prepends the path. It knows where to find it. So, when you want to compile a code with something like GSL, I'm using the wrapper. I all I need to do is specify the package I'm linking. I don't have to give it the locations or the includes. That's all taken care of automatically. So um, that's a convenient thing. If you're compiling your own shared libraries, you should, um, you know, you can 
use this command to, to essentially uh, achieve the same result with these dynamically linked libraries. And by default, uh, Cray will make, uh, well, we'll build these uh, executables by default to make them dynamically linked. Um, another point to point out here about libraries and linking is this Cray link type static uh, is no is is it can fail and is not currently supported on Perlmutter. So um, if you're using that flag when you do your compiles, then that's something you're going to have to investigate uh, further with us. This slide uh, summarizes some uh, some useful. Compile compilation flags when you're compiling. Uh, in particular, the highlighted blue line is uh, something I want to mention. Is that uh, to enable OpenMP for your for your codes, uh, you have to include the flag. Um, my understanding is on Quarry that was happened by default, uh, but now you must explicitly include that flag with your compilation to get that capability. Um, and finally, um, just some like tips for stuff we've been encountered, if, especially for if you're trying to compile older codes coming from Quarry to Perlmutter, uh, some quick tips for you. So if you're doing a Fortran code, uh, there is, um, if you find that your code doesn't automatically just compile like it did before, uh, especially if you're coming from the Intel compiler to the maybe the G Fortran compiler, you can look for some compiler flags to, to basically alleviate some of those errors. Um, in particular, I'm recommending this dash standard equals legacy flag. Um, another one that you hear a lot is this f allow argument mismatch. Um, both, you know, this one it's included in the standard legacy flag, uh, but you can also do it separately to achieve the same result. Um, for C++, you can take a similar path to look for things like the f permissive flag, which will uh, make the compiler less strict. Uh, you can get more information about code standards by adding this dash w uh, pedantic flag as well. So I'm hoping that if you run into troubles, you can try some of these tips and, and they'll help you uh, move forward. Uh, finally, just to mention, there's some, you know, I said the big three, there's some other ones that might uh, programming environments uh, and compilers that may be a little bit uh, harder to find. So I highlight them here. Uh, for example, we have this Clang Intel in compiler. Uh, available under the programming environment LLVM. It's not as full featured. Uh, it doesn't use the compiler wrappers, right? The way you access it is first you have to load these module files by using module use. Then you load the nurse programming environment NPE, and then you load programming environment LLVM. And if you want to compile a C++ code, you have to use this command here. If you want to compile a C code, use this command here. Um, and there's not a Fortran one available for that yet. Similarly, if you're one of the people who know you really want MPI, uh, there is some MPI on Perlmutter, but you have to use module use first to access those module files, uh, then module load open MPI. And then this is how you would compile those codes using open MPI. Um, for more info, it's, it's here in the docs. Okay. Um, just to, to make this, Totally crystal clear. Uh, if you have a code on Cori and you want to run it on Perlmutter, you probably should recompile it. Uh, you know, it's. I mean, I imagine maybe it could run. I, I'd be surprised. Uh, but take your take your source code, move it to when you're on Perlmutter, recompile it again, and then start doing your runs. I mean, if you, yeah, I, that's this is the way forward. So. Uh, what I'm going to do now is show you some examples of just how to compile codes on, on Perlmutter. Um, and I, the, my example code is just a hello world that has both MPI and OpenMP um, it, built into it. So, you know, the details of this aren't, aren't really important just to know that it's a, a simple code that does these things. Okay, so this is an example of using the compiler wrappers on uh, Perlmutter. All right, so that's my example. These are the modules I have loaded. Like we said before, you can see I'm in the programming environment GNU. So when I do this command, it's going to use the GNU compiler to compile my code. Uh, because I want to enable OpenMP, I have to include that flag. It will not be included by default, so you must include that flag. Um, now I'm 
specifying the uh, environmental variables for OpenMP. Um, and that one should be OpenMP proc bind uh, true should now go to equal spread. We'll talk about that later. Um, but I just have to point out here. And I'm also in an interactive node, so I'm not, not running on a login node in case you're, you're wondering. But so the, the takeaway from this short example is if you were using the wrappers before and you're using them now, uh, compiling on Cori and compiling on Perlmutter isn't that different, right? This, you, you, if you're using compiler wrappers, you should be mostly the same and, and it should, you know, like we say, just work. Uh, the only thing you may have to look out for is that dash F OpenMP flag if you are using OpenMP in your code. Um, this is the second example. In this example, um, what I've done is I've I have a, a software package that I manually installed in my user space, and I want to link against the libraries that it provides. So um, this, you know, this is kind of a more manual approach. I, I think it's worth uh, looking at because I, I'm sure I'm not the, you know, from my experience, uh, there's more than one or two users who who wants to manually link their own libraries. Um, so this is what this example is showing you. I'm trying to compile the, my example, this hyper uh, underscore exc that requires uh, a hyper underscore utilities.h file uh, that's, in, that's included in the hyper package that I've already downloaded and installed in a different location. Um, because the path to that location is kind of long, I, I save it as an environmental variable like this. So the hyper underscore dir. And then I'm going to use, um, I'm going to use that. Uh, to access the files, but also in my compile line. So this is just showing you how I can use that environmental environment variable uh, to to uh, to to run commands and, and use it in other ways. So here I'm explicitly including the includes from the hyper directory, and I'm these are the, the lub the libraries and linking hyper, and then I'm running the code, and we see it compiles correctly. And again, I'm on an interactive uh, session here, so I'm running it and it's not on a login node. So, so the, the next section um, I spent quite a bit of time on, and, and this is kind of like, I hope this, I hope this helps. I think what my, my goal here is like, I wanna take you from looking at a job script like this and wondering, kind of what is going on with all these things and give you some understanding you know not you know not 100 percent, but but some feeling or instinct about whether what you're doing seems reasonable and and to do that i really have to talk a lot about the architecture of the Perlmutter cpu node um and and things you know and the way the memory set up so that's what the next section is going to be discussing um I'm starting here from the JavaScript because this is how I want to you to kind of approach it, right? I want to translate the the commands and the parameters that I select here over to these ideas, right? So you know I listed these key terms here: the node, MPI task, logical CPU, thread, physical core, processor, and NUMA domain. Uh, all of these are going to relate back to the parameters and things you do here. So um, let's go for it. <laughs> So the first thing I'm going to talk about with the job parameters is how it relates to the hardware. So, and the first, you know, thing that you are going to encounter is that the terms used for things are not always the same. They sometimes are the same, and they are not always different, and they are sometimes different. So, um, if you pull off the Perlmutter system architecture page, what it says about a Perlmutter CPU node. And you compare it about other places in the nurse doc. Um, some places it will call it CPUs. Some places will be referring them to processors. I'm going to try to stick to just one way to refer to each thing for the next ten slides. So if if it's a CPU on this one, I'm going to be talking about the processor. And when I talk about a processor, I'm talking about the the the, the chip that you see in the motherboard. Uh, when I talk about physical cores, I'm going to talk about how that processor, that chip you see in the motherboard, is split up into smaller computational units. And with inside each one of those physical cores, you know, we have 
I'm going to call them logical CPUs, but this is when we start talking about like hyper threads. That's another way to think of you know, hardware threads. There's also terms that have been used to describe this. So uh, on Perlmutter CPUs, there's two logical CPUs per physical core. And again, this is just to point out that you also see socket, but here I'm going to be using it, the word processor to refer to the chip uh, in the same, the chip that goes in the socket, um, essentially. So by, by adopting these terms and keeping them consistent to the next couple slides, I hope that helps keep these concepts clear. So if you were walking down the street and you ran into a Perlmutter CPU compute node, would you know what it was? Would you know what it looks like? Well, here's a nice picture, okay? So if you were walking down the street, you run into this thing, this is the Perlmutter CPU compute node, uh, this diagram here on the right. Um, what I want to do now is relate these terms to parts of this diagram. So the first thing is the node. So the node is, I'm going to say, is the big outer square that includes both this yellow box and this yellow box, which represent the processors. So in each Perlmutter CPU node, you have two AMD Milan processors. We're going to count from 0, 0, and 1. So 0 is one here, and 1 is here. Inside, each one of these processors is going to have 64 physical cores. Right, That's the lines you see here and whatnot. Next to each uh, group of 16 of them, they have their own memory that will come into play later and we'll discuss it more. Um, but within each one of these physical cores, you have two logical CPUs for doing um, you know, what they call hyper-threading. Uh, so you get two logical CPUs. So that's the diagram for the Perlmutter CPU. And those are the terms. So I'm trying to give you a sense of how those relate. Uh, I'm going to give you this office building analogy. Hopefully this helps you, uh, maybe not immediately, uh, but later when we start thinking about things, it's going to be useful to be thinking about when are we talking about uh, different parts of the architecture and how it affects things. Um, so, so bear with me. Um, so one way to think about a CPU compute node is you could think about it as like one floor in an office building. You know, the Perlmutter machine is made up of multiple nodes. We're going to be talking about one part of that, one floor of the office building. You can think of that one floor of the office building having two office floor plans, right? one representing each processor. Inside your office floor plan, you're made up of little cubicles. So each square is a little cubicle here. And, um, you know, in case you're, you're following along, uh, the question the mystery question of the day is which cubicle represents which system, right? So this one, uh, there's one nurse system that would have a four person cubicle um, and uh, only one. So which one or which which nurse system node has a four person cubicle? Uh, the, the cubicles on the Perlmutter CPU are two person cubicles. So inside a two person cubicle, any little box like this, you have two people working at their stations. Right. And those are the logical CPU or the hardware threads. So the cubicles are the physical cores. These are the logical CPUs that are doing the work within it. All those physical cores come together to be the processor. And you know, we'll, we'll bring this home point home more, but you know, physical cores that are closer together, usually it's easier for them to communicate. If I'm a physical core working here over with the office people over here, that might take longer, might not be as efficient. So that's when we start getting into the numa domains, which we'll talk more about. Okay. So this is to highlight where we are now. So if I say dash N2, I'm talking about nodes. You now have a sense of what those nodes, what I'm talking about when I say a node, right? Now when I say dash C16, right? Those are the logical CPUs. These are the workers inside your cubicle, inside your office plan, inside your uh, office building, right? So you have a, a clear sense of, what this is talking about or what these numbers mean and how it corresponds to the hardware on that um, on that node. So that's why I highlight these. And then again here, when we talk about the CPU bind setting, when I say cores here, you know that this is uh, relating to the physical core, right? The cubicles that we talked about here. So now you have a sense of this what this core word is meaning on, in association with the hardware. Now, the next step is this, still other parameters, but these ones are associated with how you're splitting up the work you're giving to the hardware, and in particular for MPI tasks and open MP threads. So I'm asking a lot, but bear with me again for my cargo analogy. Uh, 
MBI tasks and threads are about how you split up your work. So the first step is taking your simulation code. And if it is, uh, you know, if you use MPI in your code, you're breaking up the work. That's all this stuff in the back of the truck into smaller blocks, right? So in particular, I'm thinking of this uh, picture representing a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 MPI tasks. Um, I really should have put a 16 here. It would make me feel a lot better, but that's okay. Uh, each one of these uh, pallets of boxes, which is you can think of as one MPI task in this uh, analogy. And each MPI, each MPI task is this pallet of little boxes, which you can further break up into open MP threads. All right. So using MPI tasks and opening to be open IMP threads is a way to like break down your work into smaller pieces from, from one starter stage to lower stage. So that's why we want to think about it that way. So now when we come back to our job script, we see, all right, what is that, the breaking up of work? When I'm taking my code and doing that, what, how does that relate to my job script? Well, the dash N, those are the pallet of boxes, right? You've taken that truck full of work and those are the, that's the actual number of pallets of boxes or pallets of in the back of the truck, right? That's where the 32 and that's what that corresponds to. The open MP number of threads is how many boxes are on each pallet, right? So when we talk about a thread now, this is the section we're talking about. And now you have an intuitive sense of what piece of the work of your simulation uh, that's relating to. And to get the rest of the terms, we have to understand Newman domains. And if you're like me, uh, this, this term um, may have been something that didn't come as easy as the other ones. So what is a Newman domain? A Newman domain is a non-uniform memory access, um, or is, what it means is non-uniform memory access. And essentially, it goes back to this idea that if I have my um, physical cores computing work on my data, I have some memory which keeps that data really close so I can do really fast work. But if I have to talk to get the data from over here uh, to work on, I have to do this communication step where the communication comes through here, and then I can get it, and then I can do the work. So if I've got this person working on this one and, and talking to this one to work on that one, you can see bouncing back and forth would make that a lot slower than if they could work right next to each other and didn't have to exchange the data uh, from one memory bank to another. So the takeaway here is it matters where on the processor you're doing the work if you want to achieve maximum performance. And if you're closer, you get better performance. So that's the whole point of a new domain. So now let's go back to our diagram of the Perlmutter CPU. Um, I should say the Perlmutter CPU node, right? If we look inside each yellow box, each processor, they're split up into four numero domains. So that means that each uh, Perlmutter CPU node has a total of eight numero domains on it. So when you're assigning, when we set some of these commands to assign where the work is gonna go on the hardware, uh, you're going to want to be aware of these eight different Newman domains um, as such. So, so, so I think we're good. Let's see here. This is a way to basically uh, provide that information in a detailed and kind of um, in detailed way. Uh, so, if you are in one of those. Perlmutter compute nodes, you can run the command uh, num act l dash h, and you'll see that there are, it says eight nodes, but these are eight NUMA domains labeled from zero to seven. It will tell you the physical cores if you're counting only red, right? You'll get up to the 128. So starting from zero to 127, 128 physical cores. Um, if you also include the logical CPUs, uh, then that's where the black numbers come from. So in this NUMA domain, you have logical CPUs, which can uh, physical cores, 16 physical cores, which includes all of these different logical CPUs. The other nice thing that it really shows you here is this distances where it gives you a measure of, you know, time units difference, depending on which NUMA domain is working with which one. So for example here, if I'm in NUMA domain one and I'm, 
talking to Newman Domain 2, it is only 12 units uh, of distance between these two. And you can consider that as like a, you know, distance is time here, uh, 12 units of time. Whereas if I was in one and I'm talking all the way to the other, you know, the, these Newman Domains live on the other processor, that time can include, it can increase to almost three times as much, right? So the, the Numa domains on my processor can be very, very quick. The ones that are further away can be longer. And this shows you specifically, if you were talking from which Numa domain to which one, uh, how exactly that impacts you. Um, because, you know, like we're talking about three times difference in performance, um, we provide multiple tools so you can verify that the affinity is working the way you want. Um, we have these binaries, um, pre-compiled -pre binaries. You can run these with this command that will spit out the information of where your ranks are um, and what the affinity settings are for each one. Um, if you're using uh, OpenMP 5.0, um, which several other compilers support, you can uh, include these environment variables and these parameters. Um, and when you run this, you'll get more information, just like you see uh, the, exactly the information, the format you want it here, so that you can read these things to make sure we're getting the thread opinion. Um, with that said, I think for most people, we're going to rely on sort of the kind of nurse defaults, and you're going to get pretty good performance with them as long as we use them correctly. So, so these are the, this is the like, We've got this, I'm going to start telling you what the suggested way is to run to make sure you don't incur uh, NUMA performance penalties and, and that your code runs well. So here are the center of the general rules of thumb. If your number of MPI tasks is less than the number of physical cores on, on the Perlmutter CPU, the number of MPI tasks on that node is less than the number of physical cores on that node, then you should be including this flag. In my experience, this is almost all the time right, that your MPI task is less than the number of physical cores. Um, so I would say, like, if I had to guess right now, I want to say 90%. If you're in sort of the much, uh, the less common situation where your number of MPI tasks is greater than the number of physical cores, then you're going to want to set this to uh, CPU bind equals threads. Um, Yeah, I'm going to leave it at that. Um, we can talk in more detail if you if you want to follow up uh, and understand these things deeply. I'm happy to chat more later. Um, if you're one of the consequences of these NUMA domains is that if you're running a hybrid MPI OpenMP code, you want to use at least eight MPI tasks. So that way, when your work gets split up across those NUMA domains, uh, your OpenMP threads are close enough to each other that they can work quickly. Um, you can imagine if you had only one uh, MPI task for the entire node that it might put one OpenMP thread way over on this side of the, the one processor and way on the other side of the other processor so that communication between them would be really slow. Whereas if you add more, pro uh, more MPI tasks, you would avoid that situation. Uh, again, another rule of thumb is the value of dash C should be the number of physical uh, logical CPUs should be greater than the number of OpenMP threads. And uh, again, for placing things correctly, to tell the, the, the job scheduler where to put the stuff in the right places, we're recommending you always set this OMP proc bind to spread and only places to threads. Um, again, there's some smaller edge cases where you might choose something different. Uh, but in, for most people, most of the time, this is probably going to give them most of the performance they're looking for. And the only other thing to point out here is that previously we'd recommended OMP underscore proc underscore bind equals true, uh, but we've found that spread is uh, probably a better a better option in in general uh, on Perlmutter CPUs. So this corresponds to these last parts of the job script: the OMP places, the CPU bind cores, and I can say now when you look at a job script like this you should have some uh, sense or feeling about where these terms are coming from and how you're setting them. Um, this, this chart uh, gives you sort of the differences between some of the uh, nodes that you know versus the ones on Perlmutter and how these numbers break down and how you can use them when you're making those decisions. So 
this is just a highlight that this this information is here. Um, and again, you know, this formula uh, will always work uh, as well. Um, I just, for myself personally, I find it helps to have that intuitive understanding. So now, practical examples of JavaScripts. All right. So if I'm doing, own, I've got an example of an MPI only JavaScript here, one from Corey Haswell. Uh, I'm including the best practice for MPI only. This is no, we're not doing any open MP threads, but I include this line as the best practice to make sure that is always clear. Um, and what I have here is I have a script uh, as such, where I'm using 40 nodes with 1,280 MPI tasks on Corey Haswell, but I wanna write a JavaScript uh, that runs this efficiently on Perlmutter CPU. And one way I can do this is as such over here, I can use 10 nodes running the same number of MPI tasks, right? That's how I, again, how I'm splitting up my work. And then this is the number of logical CPUs per MPI task. So how do I calculate this value? And, you know, why do these things end up being different, right? Well, I'm starting with my number of MPI tasks. I'm dividing that by the number of nodes that I'm using. And that gives me how many MPI tasks per node, right? Then I look at how many logical CPUs, uh, logical CPUs I have for that node. And in Corey Oswald, the case, it's 64. Uh, and then I divide that by the number of MPI tasks. And that leaves me with two logical CPUs uh, for each uh, MPI task. And that's why I get the dash E2. Likewise, because the numbers are, are the number here, uh, especially is going to be different, right? I do my 1,280 MPI tasks. I'm dividing across 10 nodes. So now I have 128 MPI tasks for each Perlmutter CPU node. Each Perlmutter CPU node has 256 logical CPUs. So when I do that division, I get two logical CPUs for each MPI task. And that's what I put here. Again, because 90% 90, 90 of the time, um, we're still we're still in this scenario. This is what's included here. Another option is I could have kept the nodes at 40 and changed. You know, now now I'm basically summoning more hardware to solve this problem. Uh, and the way I way that affects my job script is the C changes accordingly. So I'm doing the same math where I have 1,280 processors and divide that by 102,080. MPI tasks, which I'm dividing by the number of nodes. That leaves 32 MPI tasks per nodes now. But because I have 256 logical CPUs, I can contribute eight logical CPUs. Those are my, my workers in the cubicle to each MPI task. And that's where the C8 comes from. Um, so this is the test. Uh, it may look simple at first, but the, the curveball is I'm, I'm also adding uh, OpenMP. Um, and the second curveball, since we're also running late, I'm going to wrap up real fast, is that it doesn't make a lot of difference. <laughs> Here's my hint. Uh, this is the math that I explained on the previous slides uh, to calculate this number. It's doing the same thing I just described, right? Where I'm doing tasks divided by nodes, then logical, CP, uh, log logical CPUs divided by the MPI tasks on each node. Um, and then the step three is something that I do because I'm also using OpenMP threads. I want to make sure that the logical CPUs is greater than, and this should say greater than or equal to uh, the number of threads that I'm assigning to each MPI task uh, here, right? So 32 is bigger than eight. So I am good. And this little script should run um, pretty well. There you go. Uh, and this is this script is to, this slide is to highlight the difference between an MPI only run and a hybrid MPI open MP run. And you notice the settings for C, CPU bind cores, um, those haven't changed. Uh, the only changes here is when the environment variables, the OMPI environment variables uh, I'm setting. Last thing to point out is we have a job script generator, which you know uses sort of um, a drop down approach where you can answer these questions, select answers, and it will automatically generate a job script. Um, this is a good place to learn and a good place to start. It may not cover every single edge case, uh, but now you understand the hardware behind it and why these numbers are what they are. So if something comes out not perfect, you can fix it. And again, just to point out here, we're going to update this very shortly. But as soon as we do that, you will see OMP, Brock, Bind, anything where it says true will be now be equal to spread. So um, just to point that note out here. 
Um, with that, I am going to stop. These are my key suggestions. So if you are going from query to Perlmutter, use module spider for a comprehensive module search, recompile your query codes on Perlmutter, start with the program in the GNU programming environment, then move to try the Cray one or try some of the other ones. Um, we highly recommend you use the compiler wrappers because they do so much for you behind the scenes. And you also need to re go back over your job scripts and recalculate the parameters to, to get good performance. Um, with that, I'm going to stop and uh, thank you for your attention. Um, Erica, I think you just go over the hands on slides because the GPU talk has the hands on built in. So let's do the CPU one here as well. Uh, one slide. Oh, this slide. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Um, so yeah, later on, we're going to have a hands on section. Uh, this is going to include these. Uh, the, um, CPU only codes that you can play with, that you can work with, and you can try out some of these uh, uh, concepts on. And, and nurse staff will be around to to guide you through that and and help you um, with those examples. Those examples are nice because you know it's good to start with something that isn't the most complicated and build your way up. So, Helen, do you want to say anything else about this slide before I move on? So yeah, we have um, a few slides and there's a readme dot first and suggest you doing the exercise following this order. You have, we have zero and MPI hello world example, hybrid uh, MPI OpenMP uh, with C and Fortran and also affinity example. So affinity is as, as uh, Eric has presented, you will see all the results, all these affinity values. You can compare against the um, diagram, the physical core, logical core numbers, so you know where your uh, process thread are uh, bind to. And there's a, another um, spec uh, using a package available from the E4S stack um, test GSL. I'll be using the reservations um, after the, the GPU talk, then will be the hands-on section today. Yeah. All right, thank you so much, everybody.